I'm Dean Newland, and welcome to the Business of Intuition, where I coach, facilitate, train, and speak on the hard science and meaningful experience of intuitive leadership in business, so you can make better decisions, forge real connections, and creatively solve problems to amplify your impact and simplify your life. Welcome to the Business of Intuition. The foremost researcher and probably most published person on the subject of meeting management is a guy named Vogelberg out of South Carolina. And he once said, and I am paraphrasing, that the perceived quality of a meeting is equal to and has a big influence on that person's overall job satisfaction. So think about it. If we're spending 10, 15, 20, 25, even 30 hours a week in meetings, if we have a better experience in those meetings, our overall job satisfaction, of course, is going to get better. A lot of us now, of course, are working from home. The pandemic is coming to an end. And even though things are looking brighter on that particular stage, a lot of us are not coming back to work. No matter what industry, there's going to be a certain percent of us who are still working from home or remotely meaning that the virtual meeting is here to stay. Now, meetings have always had a bad rap. We keep wondering about what's my role? Why am I here? What's the purpose? We're spending way too much time on getting information versus discussing the most important thing. We have people who are speaking up, others who are not. The list goes on and on and on. Now you add on top of that a virtual environment, it just compounds those issues by a factor of five. So then how do we make meetings virtually more effective, more efficient, so that we spend more time actually discussing the things we need to discuss and less time having to figure out what it is that we're trying to be doing and making sure that we are all on the same page? Well, my next guest on the business of intuition actually has started to attack that problem, and he's come up with a really important and I think useful app. In fact, one that I'm going to even start using. His name is Richard White, and he is the founder and CEO of Fathom Video, a free app that records, transcribes, and highlights your calls so that you can focus on the conversation instead of taking notes. Fathom was part of one of the only 50 Zoom app launch partners and is one of a small handful of companies Zoom has invested in directly via their Zoom apps fund. Prior to Fathom, Richard founded User Voice, one of the leading platforms that technology companies from startups to Fortune 500 companies use for managing customer feedback and making strategic product decisions. User Voice was notable for being the company that originally invented the feedback tabs shown on the side of millions of websites from around the world today. Richard White on the business of intuition. So, Richard, great to have you on the business of intuition. I'm um, just downloaded your app, Fathom, and we're now using it in this particular conversation. And um, I'm fascinated by understanding how it works more. I, and um, I know in the show notes, we'll give people information about how to connect to it and download it and, and how to use it in terms of uh, increasing people's efficiency. But when it comes to teams, let's start off with that. We've been through one hell of a few years here with, with, uh, with COVID and a lot of people have gotten very used to working from home. Organizations are now really opening up their hiring practice to say, hey, guess what? You don't have to live in our backyard. In fact, you don't even have to come into work or if you do, it's very infrequent. So we're gonna probably have you interact with us much more over Zoom or WebEx or so forth. And it's, I think even after the, you know, we get this pandemic past us, we're not going back, you know, we're not going back to full everybody at work. We're gonna have a certain percentage of people working from home. Tell me about your ideas about how we can make teams more efficient, whether it's with your particular software add-on to Zoom or others, but in this virtual world of Zoom and WebEx and video conferencing, what are some of the tips and trades and hacks that we can use to be able to make ourselves more efficient? Sure. 
So it's interesting. My previous company, User Voice, that I started in 2008, we were originally for the first, I think, 18 months, a completely remote company. And then we actually had two offices early on. So we always kind of had a remote culture, even once we had an in-office culture. And, and Fathom, which you just downloaded, thank you for doing that. Excited for yeah. you to try it out. Uh, we're a fully remote company from day one. We've been running now for about 18, 20 months. And so I, I think there's actually... You know, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, everyone's been kind of forced to do remote remote work now, and I think for a lot of companies, the, the challenge has been, you know, it's it's a different kind of animal, and they've been trying to translate what just worked in office to to remote. And I think having done both, what you kind of don't notice is when you have an office, there's a lot of like ambient knowledge transfer. You overhear someone on a call, or they just come out of a room, and like, how'd that call go? Oh, it went well. Like, you know, there's like just a lot of kind of like ambient kind of chatter and sharing about like, what are we hearing? You know, you think about the traditional sales floor, right? Like you can, you can hear the people on the sales calls, you hear them get excited, you hear them not like there's, there's actually a lot of information that's just kind of like at the water cooler, at the lunch table, people talking, you know, across the office. And you don't get that when everyone's working from home. And so I think what I've seen the, the best remote companies do, they're very intentional about how to create kind of like ambient streams of information about what's happening with with the business, right? And I think mm. more specifically, what are we hearing from customers is always one of the top things, right? Mm. Um, whether it's coming from your sales team or your your account management team or you know product team, you name it. And so, you know, we try to do a lot of things where I always ask, you know, does this need to be a meeting or is there a way that we can asynchronously share this content? And you know, that applies to whether we're doing like planning or you know sharing out our updated roadmaps or whatnot. Like we often try to err on the side of let's share content first. And if we have a meeting, it's mainly just to see each other or to discuss something. And then the other side, using Fathom or you know, uh, you probably probably the tools you use, but using Fathom, you're recording calls of customers and we're setting up so that you can take the most important moments and immediately have them shipped into Slack channels. So we have a Slack channel where I can kind of see. I'm no longer on all of our customer calls anymore, right? We've got a team that's doing that. They're talk, they'd be talking to folks like you, getting your feedback. How's the product working? What would you like to see differently? And rather than me just getting a bunch of notes about that later on or be in a meeting, I see the stream of clips coming in, you know, usually 10 to 30 second clips of customers saying like, this is awesome, or this could be better in this way. And not only I see that, but our entire engineering team sees it. And I think that's what's important is that the entire organization has the same context. We're all seeing the same inputs. And therefore, we're all kind of have a much more like shared understanding of where we are as a product and as a business that makes, you know, motivation and planning and everything else so much easier because we don't have to spend a bunch of time getting on the same page. That's a great, uh, I get it now, the ambient learning that happens through this product that you have just described that we can sort of see the written transcripts of our conversation, say with our client, say with a customer and so forth. Is there the and I'm curious what you think about this, the challenge that we are already overwhelmed with so many things trying to scream attention and get attention, and that one more thing popping up in my screen that I'm supposed to read, I might not, because it's just, I've got something else to do. I'm, I'm, you know, now I have to now take my mind off of this and read that, focus on one thing as hard enough as it is. Now you're introducing another distraction. What do you, how do you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I generally think that asynchronous things are way less taxing than synchronous things. So I, I think I'd rather I think it's way less uh, taxing for me to get an extra email than to get an extra ten minute meeting on my calendar. And so the okay. the, the so I think the trade off there is that like yeah we do have more things more inboxes necessarily that you may want to look at or that we uh, ask folks to look at, but we also trade that off by giving you a lot less meeting time. Right, we only have really like two standing meetings a week across the entire team, and so we and we constantly ask this question. You know, does this? Do we still need this meeting, or can this meeting now be replaced by, you know, some ambient stream information? The other thing that's nice about that is like meeting. A lot of usually meetings are used as content delivery, right? And this yes. is one of my bold pet peeves. Like meetings should not be for content delivery; they should be for discussion, right? We've, we we right. should already get the content ahead of time. And uh, if you're familiar with like Amazon tries to get around this by they have like you know six minutes. They have a six page memo you have to write before every meeting, big executive meeting. So you have to write yeah. a six page memo. They'll have an hour long meeting, and they force everyone to spend the first fifteen minutes just reading the memo, so they all have context, right? Yes. So there's all these strategies like how do you not use meetings for context sharing or for information sharing? And how do you just use them only ad hoc when you need to have a discussion? And that's kind of what we do. So we're kind of trading, I think, one thing for another. And the other nice part about that is 
then people can consume them whatever makes sense for them. Because the meetings very have a heavy hand. It's like, oh, we're having a you know 10 person meeting. We're going to force all 10 people to be in this moment consuming the same content. That may not be the best moment for all of them, right? They actually may have something else on their mind. And so we kind of generally say like, great, you can, you are going to have a meeting in three days. I'm going to tell you some information you need for it now. And someone will look at it today, someone will look at it tomorrow, someone will look at it the next day. And frankly, sometimes not everyone will look at everything. And that's also okay, right? Like you don't have to be up on everything. So long as like 30 to 60% of the people know, what the, the, like we don't, then we will as a, as a group have like total understanding, right? Not everyone has to know everything. So that's a great, that's a great point. Uh, we've actually kind of delved into this meeting management issue a lot over the last several years. And you know, we even try to create an app, which we really never got out of, uh, you know, for a stage, but it was trying to develop an understanding of how much does this meeting cost to have everybody there so we can plug into an app, everybody's salary, you know, you would do that confidentially, you add on a certain percentage for other things that are like benefits and bonuses and so forth. And then you get it down to the aggregate per hour per person. And you got 10 people sitting in a meeting and you times that by, you know, one hour times 10. And all of a sudden you get this <laughs> huge, huge number, right? That's a $10,000 meeting. And then we ask people to rate the quality of the meeting on a scale of one to 100. And we find that maybe around 40%, 50% at the most, do people feel that the meeting was, was valuable? The other 40 or 50 or 60% was unvaluable. And then you take that number and you times the, the, the dollar amount per hour and you go, wow, we just lost so many thousands of dollars by having an unproductive meeting. And we spend so much time, you know, trying to understand what the cost of pencil sharpeners are in our companies, but we don't understand what the cost of an unproductive meeting is. And so I think what you've, what you've got here, Richard, is really something very valuable because it's probably, tell me if I'm wrong, going to cut down on the number of meetings that we have. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's really twofold. I mean, one is, I think for a lot of like customer calls, you can't put 10 people on the meeting from your side. Right. And everyone wants to hear, right. I want to hear what did that customer say, you know, when they objected on to our price or when they mentioned that competitor, I want to hear it firsthand. And then for internal meetings, you're right. Like I, I call it kind of like meeting inflation where, you know, we had this meeting originally it was five of us, but that one time we needed Tim from accounting. And so now Tim has to come every single time this meeting. Oh, and now we also need Sally for marketing. Okay, now Sally's going to come to this meeting every <laughs> single time, right? Yeah. And so the other thing we do is allow you to have you know smaller meetings. And if you, you know, oh my gosh, we should really told Tim about that last five minute discussion. Great, you can grab that clip out of Fathom and say, hey Tim, like we just talked about this. You should definitely you know check out this wow. discussion, right? And so That's great. And so now Tim doesn't have to come to every one of these meetings. Uh, Stephen Wolfram, who is the CEO, uh, founder CEO of this company, Wolfram Alpha, which is like yeah. this kind of like Mathematica, whatever. They are a remote company too. And they've been remote, I think, for like 25 years. Huh. And he has some, a lot of interesting takes on remote culture. And one of those was all of their meetings are video off. And Interesting. Why? And he said, because, well, he said two reasons. One, when the video is on, it's much more mentally taxing because everyone's worrying about how they look. And like, yeah. am I smiling or is like, am I, you know, am I, does it look like I'm paying attention? And he's like, honestly, he's like meeting, he's kind of says like this kind of meeting inflation is always, always happens. And so rather than try to like kick people out of the meeting, you just turn off video. You also give people permission to not fully pay attention. Right. Because we've all ah. been in those meetings where like, yeah. I could tell for the next five minutes, I don't need to be part of this conversation. I would love to answer those last three emails. Right. And he's like, I yeah. trust my team enough you know, and they can't do that. The video is on, right? But the video is off. He's like, I trust them enough to be able to listen with one ear and like do so much stuff and know yeah. when you need to jump in. And so it's a really interesting kind of counterintuitive thing because I do think when we first went to remote work, all these companies are not used to doing this. We're like, you got to turn your video on and like, you know, and like kind of did things the way that all the like long term remote companies weren't like, oh, no, no, like that's actually counterproductive, which is fascinating. Well, it's, I wonder if you could do a hybrid of that though. I mean, I like right. the, the premise, like you say, got it, guys. We're going to have videos on. And if you do not want to participate in this conversation, go ahead and check out your email. Yep. You know, if yep. in fact, that is the guiding principles of that particular meeting. Yeah, But I do, do, I do think that of... we miss something when we don't see the white of each other's eyes. There, <laughs> there's an emotional disconnect that we have to people when we can't see them. 
Yeah, we do a lot of ad hoc audio only meetings, like, and those are nice, but you're right. Like you need a balance. Like sometimes you need a, you need a diverse, you know, diversified portfolio of like asynchronous communication, you know, synchronous all hands. We see each other's faces and we do try to get everyone to turn on their camera. Like it's building connection. And I'm just trying to accomplish something, which is jump on an audio thing real quick. Cause I don't need you to like think about whether your kids are in your background right now or like what your hair looks like today. I just need to talk to you for 10 <laughs> seconds rather than push, push a bunch of emails back and forth. I know it's always my wife gives me a hard time because like I, I will have a, a Zoom meeting with a client and there's a certain sort of dress code that's expected. But then the bottom half of me is in flip flops and cut up <laughs> jeans, you know, but the top half is a suit and tie. It's like I walk around like, well, look at the disconnect between the top and the bottom. And I'm sure everybody has had that experience. But, you know, when you when you look at the research and the, and the experience that you are having with companies. Do you personally advocate for hey, we need a certain percentage of our interactions to be face-to-face, -face, live, in an office, seeing each other, three-dimensional, so forth. Or are you saying, you know what? Certain industries, certain companies don't need to do that. What's your opinion? I think it's more the latter. The paradigm I'm seeing a lot for remote companies is the we get together you know, once, twice, four times a year as like an offsite to do a lot of... To, you know, to kind of build some like human connection. Yeah. Um, and, and and then we expect on those offsites to get you know seventy percent attendance because it's just hard to get everyone you know everyone's you know travel and whatever schedules lining up the same way right and to right. kind of make it more of like a open invitation to come check out this thing it's going to be fun like you know we're going to do a little in in person collaboration yeah. um, but I think you know it's in there is some trade offs right like it is you know sometimes you know whiteboarding something is a little bit harder but I think in general all that stuff the the technology is starting to catch up where I feel like the Virtual meetings are getting better than the in-person meetings, right? Like actually with our Interesting app, right? comment like, there, Richard. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. There's I mean, the bomb. <laughs> I mean, I I think, you know, I actually avoid in-person meetings because with our app, Fathom it records, you know, records the meeting, gets me my notes. Like I don't have to like be as focused and make sure I remember every single little detail because I always go back to it right later on. And that to me has changed how I interact with meetings. Now I just have more just open conversation and I'm not obsessed with like, oh my gosh, what did he just say? I need to write that down. And when I'm in person, I no longer have that thing backing me up and I'm just not as effective. And I forget all these action items I was supposed to follow up on because I've just lost that discipline a little bit. And so yeah. in a lot of ways, I prefer to have a virtual meeting for that reason. All right. So here's a question. I know there's a lot of different apps out there. I've looked at Mural. I've looked at a few others. I can't remember their names. But when you're doing a meeting, sometimes you need to collaborate. You need to pull out some small breakout groups. We need to work on this process. We're creating a strategic plan. We're working on this particular problem together. We can't do it in person for whatever reason. We choose not to. We want to do it virtually. Do you have any best in class? I love these sort of you know collaborative software that might yeah. in fact be something you can play in the background or a separate URL. What is your choice? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're part of this new kind of Zoom apps platform. There's now apps built into Zoom, kind of like plugins, right? That work really yeah. well with Zoom. And you mentioned one of the Miro. Another one is uh, that I know is called Scribble Together, where there's like very lightweight kind of like, you know, whiteboarding tools for when we're all on a virtual meeting together. Okay. Good. That's good, good to know. Hey, you mentioned something. I'm going to change gears here for a little bit. You mentioned something in the information that you'd sent me, uh, this phrase called T-shaped entrepreneurial or entrepreneur. What is a T-shaped entrepreneur? I'm curious about that. I'm, I've got the feeling there's got to be a story behind that. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know where this phrase comes from, but this basically the idea that like you have a little bit of knowledge across all disciplines. Um, mm. So for example... And then you're, but then you're super deep in like one area. So my background is, is programming, right. And product design. Yep. And I've done a lot of product design on, on Fathom, but in my past company for, there was a time where I ran the marketing team. There's a time where I ran the sales team. There was a time where I, you know, almost any function in that company I did for a certain period of time. And I think, you know, that taught me a lot that I've now taken into this startup where I know enough about all these disciplines to be dangerous to like, figure out, you know, help us figure out what the version one is that we need to do of marketing or sales or go to market. And also know a little bit enough to like hire someone to do it better than me. Right. And okay. I think that was in the beginning of my career, I was, you know, I was an eye shaped person, right? Like I only I knew product it. engineering and it was really, you didn't know what you didn't know. And it was really hard to know how do I evaluate good marketers? What is good marketing? What are the options? And, and what you learn is like, in a, almost all these disciplines, there's generally a few different lanes you could take. There's only so many 
you know, sales methodologies. There's only so many marketing methodologies to a certain degree. Yeah. And so just knowing the menu is very helpful. And so this is kind of, I think just in general, they call them like T-shaped people. So T-shaped people are, are like this broad across a lot of different disciplines, deep yeah. in one. And I think there's kind of a concept of like T-shaped people doing entrepreneurship. That's interesting. And I think of it as, uh, you know, this, the individual contributor who is a subject matter expert at some point, because companies do this all the time, they keep promoting them. You know, mm -hmm. we, we're going to give you now a supervisor role, a manager role, a VP role. And as you keep going up the ladder in the traditional hierarchy of companies, those requirements at those levels start to change. No longer is my subject matter expert skills the thing that's going to make me successful. It's going to be this, this top of the T, if you will, that I, I have knowledge in a lot of things, but I also now I'm developing and working with people who can do the thing that maybe I used to do, maybe even better, and other things. So now become a conductor versus the first chair, if you will. Yep. Yeah. There's a lot of value in being a generalist in terms of just being able to like relate to peers and understand, ah, okay, I know enough about how this department is running that I can be a good peer to it, right? As yeah. I climb the as I climb the ladder. So Richard, how did you get into this? So, I mean, why did you start this? this app, what, what was this, what got you going? Like, ah, we got to do something here. What was the impetus? Um, well, I mean, it was scratching my own itch. I was at my last company doing a bunch of research and talking to a bunch of customers. And I think, you know, it was about two years ago. It was like January, 2020. I remember I did like 300 zoom calls with customers in the first six weeks of the year. Oh. And, and it was one of these things where like, I love doing that stuff. I love talking to customers. It's super engaging, right? It's super interesting. It's like, you know, doing this detective work and figure out how we can, you know, solve some problem for them. But what I hated doing was trying to like, like type out notes while I'm getting all this like really interesting information. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I always like to tell folks I'm is an uh, engineering term. I'm single threaded, meaning when I start typing, my mouth stops moving. And so it's very mm. awkward for conversations. I'm not good at doing things at the same time. Right. Right. And so one, that was really stressful. And then I generally found that like, I don't know about you, but like generally notes I type while I'm in a meeting are more like mnemonics that help me write the notes right after the meeting than mm. like than like fully fleshed out concepts. And yes. so I'd have like a five minute window after every meeting where I was like, oh my gosh, okay, got to get all out of my head. Like, you know, got to get everything in my head before I forget it all. Right. And so that's stressful because, you know, if I have another meeting or if I get delayed from that, you know, I get the end of the day and I'm like, I don't remember what any of these notes mean. But yeah. frankly, the most, you know, so I do all that. I did what I thought was actually pretty diligent, good note taking. And then I go look at it two weeks later. And I'm like, I don't remember the important like details of the conversation. And more importantly, when I try to share with my team, hey, here's what I've learned from all these 300 calls. It just something was lost in translation. I'd have an amazing insight on a call and it turns into a bullet point that I share with the team and they all kind of shrug. And so we did this experiment where I just, instead of showing them bullet points, I'm like, all right, so we just did a bunch of research this week. Here's a highlight reel of like three 30 second clips of what customers said about this thing we're building. And it mm -hmm. just blew people's minds, right? And it was just like, it got everyone really excited about what we're doing. It got them really excited about like going and solving that problem. And so I was like, wow, there's really something here. Like note taking is terrible for the note taker and also terrible for the consumer. It's just a really bad game of telephone that has to be something better. And so that's yeah. what led us down this path to, well, let's start recording these. Let's, let's not just record them. Let's allow us to like, let's record them really quickly. So I have the, so I have my notes as soon as the call ends. Let's allow me to, in the moment, click a button when I hear something important, because I know not the entire call is interesting, but I know uh, mm. I want to come back to this point in the call. Let me click a button so I can jump back to this after the call ends. We actually find that people only find like 15 to 20% of calls, quote, noteworthy, right? And the rest yeah. of it is kind of on rails. And so what no one wants to do is go back and re-listen to a 30-minute call just to find right. the right. three to five minutes that are important. So you know in the moment when those moments are. And so we would just give you a little apparatus to be like, oh yeah, flag this. I want to come back to it after the call. I want to share it with my team. I want to get it in my CRM. I want to send it to the, you know, someone else. Right. And so that's what we help you do. Yeah. I'm looking forward to downloading some videos to learn out more about this app because I think this was going to be very helpful for me because of the amount of Zoom calls I do. The podcast, as I mentioned to you before we started this conversation, I keep getting people say, hey, we got to actually capture this stuff. <laughs> And yep. maybe use it for marketing and so forth. When you started this, though, Richard, I mean, it sounded like you had a lot of obvious ideas about how to make this work. But I'm assuming that there's a somewhat of a leap of faith. I mean, you got capital. I mean, maybe you were funded by your company. But, you know, what, what got you to sort of 
jump into this full force, you know, and go, let's risk this. Let's make this happen. What was the process to get you to going from this has never been done to let's do it? Yeah, I mean, I think with this startup, I had very high conviction early on just because, you know, scratching my own itch and then seeing, you know, and then we did a little research. But just the fact that like we could build out kind of a prototype and I could see like how it changed like my work experience. I was like, okay, I'm reasonably convinced that there's a lot of people that have the same challenge I do, right? Because when I just socialize this a little bit, I'd hear what you're saying. People nod their heads like, yeah, I hate note taking and all this sort of stuff. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, I think every startup has kind of a lot of ups and downs, right? And we had the same thing. I mean, every month there's an up and there's a down. But I think that I had really strong conviction from an early phase that like, this is like, we're on to something here. Like, this has already changed my work life. Like, even in the beginnings when like, it wasn't working for some users because it was too buggy or whatnot. I just had really high conviction that if we, we there's a version we can build pretty quickly here that people are really going to love. And I think that's changed over my career. I think in the past, like, you know, first startup I did, I would think it was a little more timid about this and just being like, gosh, I don't like, you know, more, more like coming from a place of fear of like, maybe I'm wrong. And maybe, maybe my like instinct is wrong. Like there's not enough people like me or I'm, you know, or this is actually not that good of a solution. But now I think one of the things that's changed, I have a lot of conviction in like my own conviction, right? If it's kind of meta, but right. Like I've, it was like, no, no, no. Like generally in the past, when I had high conviction about things, they were generally right. And when they weren't right, like I learned from it. So I think it's also just trusting my own, my own gut on a lot of the stuff has changed a lot over the last 15 years of doing startups. And a plug for this show, your intuition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. yeah. So let me ask another question here that might be unfair, but you know, you've got this nice tool, this, and which is a, a, I'm really looking forward to playing around with it. You've had a pretty successful career, it sounds like. It sounds like this tool is working and you're getting good feedback. It must be if it's part of the series of tools that could be easily connected to Zoom. So you've already got a great partner there. So if you're, you've created, you created a great tool, but what's the throughput? What's the ultimate purpose behind all this? What are you trying to really do? Like, what's the product of the product? I mean, what's the outcome that you're trying to help people improve their lives in some way? Can you define that in some two or three sentences that says, why I'm doing this. Think about Simon Sinek and his golden circle and the why, right? What's the why behind this? We know what the tool is. It might work very well. And we assume it does. What's the why? I mean, there's there's two, right? Like at an individual level, the why is we're all on a bunch of Zoom calls, right? There's got to be a better way for us to do them and not be as stressed out about them, right? And be able to kind of relax and have a conversation and not worry about missing something. And I think there's a very emotional why there, right? Like, why we have too many Zoom calls, we're too stressed out. And then I think from an organizational level, you know, my last company, we ran the entire business based on all these notes in our CRM, right? Like everything we knew about a customer was based upon, was only as good as the notes our salespeople, our customer success or whatever put into our CRM. And mm-hmm. to me, that is just kind of insanity, right? When I think about how bad, you know, I like, I ran our sales team. I know how bad most of their notes were, right? And so I think there's a future here where, we will have a really rich like understanding of who our customers are and like what's working for them, what's not. And we'll do that off of kind of mining the catalog of all the conversations we've recorded with them, Mm -hmm. as opposed to mining the, you know, six bullet points we get out of an hour long conversation from whatever sales rep. And so that's the, you know, that's the future. Whereas like, not only, not only is it less stressful for individuals, but for people trying, people not on the front lines, trying to understand what's happening. Right. Like yeah. if you're an executive position manager, you're constantly trying to make sure I understand what's happening on the, those front lines. Right. Yes. And it's hard to do. And, you know, just looking at the notes in the CRM, you know, when I was looking at the notes in the CRM for our sales team, I was always asking this question, which was, yeah, but what do they really say? And yeah. so I think, I think that's, you know, if we can surface to you, here's the, you know, across eight hours of content. If you watch this 10 minutes of content, you will really understand the evolution of this customer, their pains, their trials and tribulations. And I think that is where we're going. That's great. I mean, I love it. You know, it sounds like it to summarize that it's about stress reduction in some ways. Yep. It's about efficiency, but it's also about the age old problem of people not knowing what they don't know. I mean, people not 
understanding that there's information out there within our teams, within our companies, but we, we don't know where to find it. You know, there's a, there's a, an age old thing I keep hearing with some companies is this company doesn't even know what they know. We don't even know. And right. I, I come in as an external consultant or coach, whatever. And I'm telling people things about what's going on in their own company. And I don't work there. Right. So how do we then create that, that latitudinal or horizontal connection of what's happening? Yep. That's great. Yeah, especially at scale, right? That that kind of like again, that stuff we talked about earlier about ambient awareness and just like how to it's really a hard problem to get a lot of humans on the same page about something, right? And that's one of yes. the biggest challenges as an org is like, how do we all sing from the same song sheet? How do we all have yep. a shared kind of reality here that we can then make decisions from? That's awesome. That's awesome. I love it. So Richard, uh, nice chat. Really, really glad that we connected. How can people connect to you, connect to your work, connect to this app, give it, give yourself a little plug on that. Sure. Yeah. If you want to check out Fathom, a uh, completely free app, again, record, transcribe, highlight your calls, share clips from them, go to fathom.video slash pod, uh, fathom.video slash pod. We have a wait list. So, you know, if you just go to the, straight to the website, you may end up in the wait list, but if you go through that link, you skip right you skip past the waitlist. And if you want to connect with me, if you have any feedback on the product or just any follow-up questions, I'm on LinkedIn. Feel free to just send me a message there. Great. Richard, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Dean, thanks for having me. It's been fun. You bet. Thank you for listening to The Business of Intuition. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about Dean, or Mission Facilitators Leadership, go to mfileadership.com. That's mfileadership.com.